Today's speaker is Andrew Cedarudal. Andrew is a second year Equal Justice Works American Corps Elder Law Justice Fellow. He works on the hotline for the older Iowans in Des Moines through the Iowa Legal Aid Office. He's practiced litigation for two years prior to his work assisting low-income victims of elder abuse. And he is a 2014 graduate of the University of Iowa. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew. All right. Thank you, Christy. I just wanted to briefly thank the Iowa Bar Association for giving me this platform to talk about something I'm really passionate about and something that I think we need to be addressing in Iowa more vigorously. Um, you all have some handouts that I've sent out. I just wanted to call your attention to the uh, last two pages of that. I'm currently seeking volunteer lawyers to help with this issue. Um, we have a lot of cases that we can't take and that we would like to be able to refer, refer out to folks who are interested. So um, if that's something that interests you, please take a look at the last two pages on the handout that has been sent to you. Okay, so I have a lot to go over. So um, I'm gonna talk about what elder abuse is, uh, what are some common difficulties that I've experienced and that you are probably going to experience or have experienced if you're dealing with this issue. I'm gonna talk about what Iowa laws address elder abuse specifically. So I'm going to go over 235B E and then 235F is the one I'm really going to hammer. That's the newer petition for relief from elder abuse that can be filed. Um, and I'm going to talk about what relationships um, are necessary between abusers and elder islands such that we can call it elder abuse under 235F. I'm really going to focus on financial exploitation because I think that's the more complicated one. Um, we're going to go over that. We're going to talk about vulnerability and a recent Iowa Supreme Court case that uh, better to find what that is. Filing the petition for relief and elder abuse, some practical stuff about that, some of the remedies you can get. Then I'm going to go over some hypothetical scenarios. All right, so what is elder abuse? Well, we got physical injury, sexual abuse, neglect, financial exploitation. Um, I do have the entire definitions in the packet um, and appear on the screen for you. I won't read it to you. Um, I do want to note that the definitions I'm using generally are 235's F, 235F's definitions. Um, under 235B and 235E, there is a slightly different language, um, but they're very similar. So if you're trying to refer someone to DHS or to DIA, you might want to use the language that they're using in 235B, 235E. All right, so what are some of the difficulties that we are going to face, that I've faced, when we are fighting elder abuse? Well, the first thing is lack of evidence. A lot of times, uh, abusers are intentionally conducting transactions with cash, makes it hard to track, makes it hard to prove. We're also going to be dealing with issues of credibility. A lot of times, our victims are extremely vulnerable. Uh, they might have mental illness and or physical problems. That's going to make our job a lot harder. We're also going to be dealing with ageism and bias. Um, a lot of things that, uh, you know, when we're thinking the abstract, we might not believe ourselves necessarily, but that impact the way that we look at these issues. Some of the examples are right there. Uh, lack of resources. A lot of folks don't have the money to pay a private attorney to, to handle these issues. Well, that's a reason that I'm really proud to be doing the work I'm doing. A lot of people don't have anywhere to turn, um, especially if their money's been taken from them. The other thing is that they don't have any knowledge about who they can contact about these issues. There's, kind of confusing. You know, do I go to DHS? Do I go to DIA? Do I go to the police? Who do I go to? Um, also, the victim uh, many times is very isolated. Uh, they might not want to turn in their family members because unfortunately, um, throughout the country, the vast majority of people who are doing this stuff are family members. Uh, they're not strangers. They're sons, daughters, grandsons, granddaughters. Um, and that just makes it really hard on the, the person who's being exploited. They also might not want to admit that they've been exploited because um, they don't want to give up their autonomy and independence. A lot of times if they admit that they've been exploited, there's going to be a, a push from other folks to take that away from them. And then the classic thing that all of us deal with a lot, that question of whether this, this person is truly being abused or if they're making a decision that they, uh, we just don't like or that we don't agree with. You know, older folks have a right to make a decision that we don't agree with. Um, so sometimes determining where the line is on abuse and exploitation or just making a decision we don't like, um, it can be difficult to ascertain. 
All right, so what laws address elder abuse? So I've already mentioned these a little bit. We have 235B, 235E, and then 235F. And then I just mentioned generally that there's other laws that we can use that aren't couched, couched in terms of elder abuse, but they can still be useful. Uh, for example, sometimes we can't really say someone's a caretaker, so we can't really refer abuse to DHS. Um, they might not be a family member. They may not be a renter. Maybe they're just in the home of a, an older island and they refuse to leave, and they're being really mean to that island, and they're having a negative impact on the island. And we can call it elder abuse generally, but we can't really call it elder abuse under the law. Well, we might resort to landlord-tenant law to evict that person. Uh, so sometimes we have to get creative about what laws we're going to use to fight elder abuse generally. So let's start with 235B. This is what DHS is looking at whenever they're determining whether someone is being abused or not. So the terms that they're using are dependent adult and caretaker. So let's start with dependent adult. What does DHS look at when they are considering whether someone's a dependent adult? Well, that's a person who's 18 years of age or older. They're unable to protect his or her interests or unable to adequately perform or obtain services necessary to meet essential human needs. And that's as a result of a physical condition, which requires the assistance of another, or a mental condition. So we have those three elements there. And um, as we'll learn later, um, that is very different from uh, the standard under 235F, this new protective order. So that's the dependent adult. Now the caretaker part, remember DHS only is investigating abuse by caretakers, not family members um, who might not be performing caretaking services. Um, so a caretaker, that's a related or non-related person who has the responsibility for the protection, care, or custody of a dependent adult as a result of assuming the responsibility voluntarily by contract, through employment, or by order of the court. So let's break that down even more. If they're voluntary, they could come up and just say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you meals. I'm going to make you some meals. They're not getting paid for it. It doesn't matter. If that person used that uh, way to get inside the older Iowans' home and then started to exploit them, for example, we could call them a caretaker. Theoretically, we should be able to um, send them over to DHS to be investigated if, if they're exploiting. Um, by contract, you know, folks could have a just a person-to-person -person private written or oral contract to provide care. If we could point to that, we could, we could say that um, an alleged exploiter is a caretaker under 235B. Um, could be employed. Okay, so the dependent adult could hire someone to come into their home to do that. And we'll get into facilities and programs later because uh, caretakers in a facility or program, um, DHS does not investigate. So um, I'll go over that a little bit later. But, um, and then by court order. Okay, so if we have a, um, someone who's a guardian conservator and they're using their position of power to exploit an older Iowan, we could still call them a caretaker under 235B. We refer them to DHS. Theoretically, they should investigate that. And so the bottom line is, um, if you suspect a dependent adult who's outside of a facility or program is being abused by a dependent adult's caretaker, as, as I've defined it under 235B, you got to report that to DHS. And again, when I say you have to report that, I mean um, if your client wants you to report it. Obviously, there's ethical issues that come into that about whether you can report. Um, but assuming your client's on board and wants you to report, you can report. And there's the number. And this is all in your packet, so don't try to write that down really quickly. You already have it. So who looks at the uh, abuse in facilities and programs? Well, that would be the Department of Inspections and Appeals. Okay, so they're going to look at dependent adults who are being abused by caretakers in facilities and programs. So let's break that down a little bit more because it's also different. And can we see how this can be confusing to the, to the common public with all these different standards? Um, 235E uh, defines dependent adult as a person who is 18 or older, whose ability to perform the, quote, normal activities of daily living is impaired, um, or they can't provide for their own care, um, their protections uh, is impaired, temporarily or permanently. So this is similar to 235B. It's not identical. So I just point this out because if we are helping folks report abuse to DHS or DIA, I think it's helpful to use the language that they want to see in our, our reports. So we have that standard. We can kind of better um, 
advertise our case to them, so, so to speak. Now, what do they mean by caretaker under 235E? Well, it's a, it's a person who's a staff member of a facility or program which provides care, protection, or services to a, depend, a dependent adult voluntarily by contract, through employment, or by order of the court. Okay, so it's just like DHS, except we're talking about caretakers in a facility or program. Typically, we think of nursing homes, but I'm going to further define what a facility and a program is uh, pretty soon here. Um, and just to point out for purposes, if, if we're talking about an exploitation, and let's say a caretaker um, in a facility program was um, exploiting a dependent adult, and then let's say they left the facility, so they're no longer part of that facility or program, DIA by statute is supposed to still be interested in that. So if we have any situation like that where um, the role changes, uh, DIA should still be interested. Okay, so what do I mean by facility? Well, if you look to the Iowa Code, I have the sites right there for everyone. Healthcare facility, okay, so that could be residential care, nursing, intermediate care, um, hospital. I didn't put the, uh, the definition of a hospital because it's quite long, but I do have the site right there for everyone if they want to look it up. Programs, elder group home, assisted living program, adult day services. If we have caretakers um, that fall under these definitions, DIA would be the proper entity to report to if abuse is occurring. So and I will admit, sometimes I get confused myself about these things like adult day services. That seems to be more in the DHL, DHS realm when I think about that, but under Iowa code, that's DIA. So sometimes I have to go back to the code myself to figure out what's the proper entity to complain to. Um, so the bottom line is if you suspect a dependent adult is being abused by a caretaker in a facility or program, you should report that to the Department of Inspections and Appeals. And here's the number for DIA. And again, uh, just to, to preface that, obviously, um, as an attorney with your ethical obligations, you have to make sure your client's on board with that um, as well. Um, and before I move on, I just wanted to mention, you know, if you help a client report abuse to DHS or DIA, and say you, you chose the wrong door, you know, you should have gone to DHS, you went to DIA, um, they're going to let each other know that, you know, you're not, you're not going to be screwed if you report to the wrong entity. Um, I just like to clear this stuff up because I think it uh, makes things move a lot more smoothly if we start at the right place. So I've gone through 235B, what DHS looks at, how they determine whether abuse is occurring, what sorts of abuse they can actually remedy. Remember, because it has to be a caretaker, not just a family member. I've gone over 235E. That's what Department of Inspections and Appeals is looking at and determining what is abuse, uh, what they can... Uh, remedy. Now I'm going to look at this new law. This is the 235F Petition for Relief from Elder Abuse. That is very helpful to us as attorneys and to the public because um, it's fairly easy for pro se folks to use, although um, still difficult, but um, it's a lot like the domestic abuse petition uh, that we have in Iowa. So let me talk about that a little bit. Um, so this is fairly new. Um, it's 2014 came out. And this is going to fill in some of those gaps that we've, we have from 235B and 235B. So, you know, I mentioned that those laws deal with caretakers. And as I've already said, a lot of the exploitation that's happening in Iowa is from our family members who might not be performing caretaking services. So they might be exploiting our vulnerable uh, population of elders here in Iowa. And even if we have the proof, DHS, DIA might not be able to do anything about it because they're not caretakers. Well, this law kind of fills in that gap a little bit. So let me talk about what relationships are necessary. So I already talked about caretakers under 235B, 235E. So under 235F, when we're going to file this protective order, it really depends on the type of abuse um, that is occurring. So if we're dealing with physical, um, physical abuse, so physical injury to injury that's at variance with the history of the injury, um, unreasonable confinement, unreasonable punishment, assault, things of that nature, um, by people who are not in a facility or program, because remember, DIA only is the only entity that gets to investigate that, uh, those types of folks, caretakers and facilities and programs. 
So if we have a caretaker outside of a facility or program, out in the community, voluntarily, by contract, um, things of that nature, um, we could use 235F against them. Um, so the victim in this case would be a vulnerable elder. I'm going to better define that a little bit later. Um, we're going to explore that Supreme Court case that came out a few months ago. And then the abuser could be anyone who's not a caretaker in a facility or program. So what's odd about that is that theoretically that could be anyone. It could be a complete stranger on the street. Um, I think that's a little weird, but um, it, it helps us with our burden. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be a family member. It doesn't have to be a caretaker. It could be anyone. The statutes, uh, it doesn't really say who the abuser has to be, except that it can't be someone in a facility or program caretaker. So what about sexual? So if we have um, the commission of a sexual offense under Chapter 709 um, against a vulnerable elder, again, I'm going to define vulnerable elder a little bit later, but the abuser, it doesn't say who the abuser can be at all. So that's kind of weird, too. It could be really anyone, and technically could be, I've never used it for this, but apparently could be even against caretakers and facilities and programs. Um, so if you follow the language literally. And then if we look at neglect, deprivation of the minimum food, shelter, clothing, supervision, or physical mental health care necessary to maintain a vulnerable elder's life, the victim here is the vulnerable elder. The abuser is the, has to be a caretaker. So we do have that caretaker standard. But remember, again, it's not caretakers in a facility or program. So we can, of course, continue to see how this would be very confusing to the common public um, and to attorneys because you really have to go to the code to look at the literal language to find out um, how this applies. And then under financial exploitation, the one I'm really going to be hitting today, um, it's uh, the statute defines it as anyone in a position of trust, confidence, or power. Okay, and that's going to include caretakers, so people hired, friends, acquaintances who voluntarily agree to do that. It could be fiduciaries, um, but again, not caretakers in facilities and programs. So it could be all those caretaking relationships, but it can also, very importantly, be family. Okay, so that's going to fill in that gap, again, that I've been mentioning that DHS can't look at if it's just family or DIA, um, and that we can use. So let's go into financial exploitation even more. So that's when a person stands in a position of trust or confidence with a vulnerable elder and knowingly and by undue influence, deception, coercion, extortion, or fraud, obtains control over, otherwise uses, diverts the benefits, property, resources, belongings, assets of the vulnerable elder. Wow, that is a mouthful. Um, let me break that down more. So, there's four parts to that, if we break that down. So, who's the exploiter under 235F? Who, who is the exploited elder island under 235F? What's the method? And did exploitation occur and what was taken? So, if we just break that down a little bit, we can more easily apply this law to any fact pattern to determine whether we can say it's financial exploitation under 235F. So the number one, who can exploit under 235F? Remember, that's a, that's a person standing in a position of trust or confidence. A statute further defines that as a parent, spouse, adult child, or other relative by blood or marriage. Okay, that's the important part, because that's where most of the exploitation is coming from. Then we have caretaker, so someone who engages in custody care or protection of an older island. And again, that may or may not be a relative. And then we have the confidential relationship with an older island, and that's more common law driven. It's not defined under the statute, but if you look at uh, cases that interpret what a confidential relationship is, it could be a fiduciary relationship, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so we, that's also kind of a broad category that we can use uh, to put alleged exploiters into so that we can file this petition against them. Okay, and then here's the interesting part. Who can be exploited under 235F? So we have this language about vulnerability, so a vulnerable elder. Now, the statute defines that as someone who's 60 years or older and that they're unable to protect him, himself or herself because of age, mental, or physical condition. And we, I mentioned this a little earlier, the Chapman v. Wilkinson, now petition of Chapman case, that went all the way up to the Iowa Supreme Court, I think it was back in February, that interpreted this issue. And I want to dive into it a little bit because 
the, uh, there's a lot of debate about this portion of the statute and this case. Um, so what happened in this case? Well, essentially the mom um, gave her trailer title to her son, but there was an understanding orally that she was supposed to live in the trailer until she passed away. And then when she passed away, the son would take ownership of the trailer. And eventually this, the son's sister moves into the trailer. The son apparently doesn't like this. So the son tries to evict his mom and basically tells her, or you could pay me $35,000 for the trailer that you gave me for free and I'll give it back to you. Of course, the mom at this point has given away all her assets. She's 69 years old. She's not working. She doesn't have the money to do that. It's kind of a jerk move on the part of the son. Um, and so the mom files a petition for relief from elder abuse after several eviction notices are posted on her door. Police have said this is a civil matter. Um, at some point, she's trying to get relief from, from this behavior. She claims she's too old to deal with this, and uh, she does this pro se. So what happens? Well, the mom won in district court. The court found that the son was financially exploiting her. Uh, the Court of Appeals affirmed that, and then the Supreme Court also affirmed. So the mom won all the way through. Um, and the two issues that the Iowa Supreme Court addressed were whether someone is vulnerable, if age alone makes that person able, unable to protect him or herself from elder abuse, and whether upon de novo review, the evidence in the case supported the finding that Chapman, the mom, was vulnerable. And I just find this really interesting, you know, the, the vulnerability uh, part of this case um, in particular. So whether Chapman was vulnerable, the Supreme Court, Iowa Supreme Court said that the language of the statute makes it clear that age is not one element among three. So if you read the, the sentence, it sounds like age or physical or mental. So age seems to be one element among the three. Um, and then the court pointed to other states that have statutes um, where age is also sufficient in those states. Um, and then as to the evidence that supported vulnerability, there's about five or six points that the court uh, made. Some of the major ones here that Ch the Chapman, the mom, gave up all her assets to her children. She's unemployed. She's older. She's clearly not able to pay the $35,000 that the son's demanding. Um, at Chapman's age, the mom's age, she was unable to pay it. Um, she voiced a concern that she was too old. Uh, the dissent called that a co colloquialism um, in this case. Um, and I just want to point out some of the really good points that were made in the dissent um, by Justice Mansfield. So what evidence was really introduced here that the mom was unable to protect herself? Um, she filed this petition pro se. Um, she said she was too old for it, but what does that really mean? Um, you know, whenever we think of being vulnerable because of age, typically we refer to a physical or mental problem that came with age, perhaps. So it seems to be intimately tied. It seems like you can't really divorce age from physical and mental um, condition. And then um, another good point is that without requiring evidence for the need for protection, the statute could be used for garden variety claims by people over 60. It's almost like, you know, if you're over 60, you're just assumed to be vulnerable. And then you could bring this against all manner of people for all manner of legal claims. And that would, of course, be an abuse of the intent of the, the law, presumably. Um, and another point, shouldn't this have been worked out in a title proceeding? Um, you know, Justice Mansfield says that uh, she wasn't in danger of being evicted. The police didn't throw her out. Um, you know, maybe she should have done this differently. Of course, she was pro se, so I'm sure she, she did not know and probably didn't have the resources to get an attorney. But um, And then finally, the elder abuse label is a stigmatizing label. So there is a concern about making that easier to get that label put on folks um, who are engaged in behaviors that may or may not be elder abuse, depending on who you ask. Um, so I just think that's a really interesting case that points out some of these issues um, that we deal with. Um, and, and I think I have a, my first question here. Let me see if I can read it. Give me one second. It's a long question. 
Yeah, how do I make it larger? <laughs> yeah. Give me one second, folks. There we go. Okay, assisted living is requiring $1,000 deposit and states that in the lease, it is non-refundable if tenant lives there for longer than a year. It's against 562A.12, requirement to return deposit, but if tenant signed lease, is tenant out the $1,000? Is this elder abuse? Well, it's an interesting case. Um, I've had these sorts of questions before about institutional entities doing things that we might not like or we think take advantage of older islands. That may be the case. Um, what I'm talking about today is more focused on the petition for relief from elder abuse, which um, you can really only file against people, not entities. Um, so, you know, family caretakers and folks like that. So I don't know that I'm prepared. I'd have to do some researching. I don't think you could use the elder abuse statute under 235F to address that wrong that you're speaking about. Um, we, we might be able to call that elder abuse generally or that it's sketchy behavior. Um, or we might have to, like I, that point I made earlier, um, resort to other uh, laws that we have to remedy the um, injustice that elders experience. Um, so I don't know if I answered the, your question, but uh, that's where I will leave that. Okay. So, and then just one other point about vulnerability. Um, the law 235B that I discussed at the beginning, where I talked about dependent adults, that it, the um, dependency has to be because of a mental or physical condition. Okay, so age alone doesn't factor into that when DHS looks at it. In fact, it's anyone over 18 um, but is, is one element, but, but age alone is not sufficient. So I just point that out. Okay, so what's the method? So we got endo influence, deception, coercion, fraud, extortion. So deception, fraud, extortion, those are not defined by statute. Um, but we have some more um, robust definitions here for undue influence, coercion. I won't read those to you. These are in your packets. But we can use these as our tool case to, uh, toolkit to apply to our fact patterns um, and try to convince judges that our clients are um, being unduly influenced, coerced, whatever it might be. And then uh, did exploitation occur and what was taken? Um, obtains control or otherwise uses or diverts benefits, property, resources, or belongings, or assets of the older island. So if that occurred, um, we need to be able to look at uh, what was taken. Pardon me one second. OK. So let me go over a scenario that kind of puts all this into the real world. So John is 82, and his physical condition makes it uh, difficult for him to leave his home. And um, Alan picks up John's medications from the pharmacy for John. John gives Alan cash to buy the medicine. The copayment for the medicine is $27. John typically gives Alan a $50 bill to pay for it. Alan never provides John with a receipt, never returns his change. John asks Alan to provide the change for his co-payments and the receipts for the purchases. Alan tells John, if you ever ask me for change again, I'll make sure you go into a nursing home. I will tell the doctor it's not safe for you to live at home anymore. Alan knows there's no basis for that threat. It's difficult for John to report what Alan is doing because Alan has to get the telephone for him when he makes calls. So is this financial exploitation? Well, when I give this talk, usually that's the most obvious one, but Let's go through the elements to better understand why that's so. We can say that Alan stands in a position of trust and confidence um, because uh, um, he is a caretaker. He's voluntarily agreed to do it. It doesn't matter if he's being paid or not. He volunteered to get the medicine on a regular basis. I can call him a caretaker. Now, number two, is John a quote unquote vulnerable elder? Well, he's over 60, and he, he has a limiting physical health condition because Alan has to get the phone for him. So I have a good argument that he's a vulnerable elder. Number three, what's the method of exploitation? <coughs> Excuse me. Alan knowingly and by undue influence, coercion, and extortion threatened to put John in a nursing home for asking about his money. So we can use a ton of those uh, uh, words that we have in the statute to describe the behavior of Alan. 
And then lastly, uh, was uh, John exploited? What was taken? Well, Allen diverted resources meant to pay for John's medicine. He never gave him back the change. So this is clearly, if we can prove all that, this is clearly elder abuse under 235F. Now, obviously, we're dealing with cash here, so, um, and it's kind of a small amount. So whether in practice this will be dealt with seriously in our justice system, um, and whether we can prove it is a different, a different story. But assuming we can prove it, this is financial exploitation. But what could be done here? So I'm trying to be as practical as possible to give people solutions to what they can do in these, in these really common situations. So first, um, John could report abuse to the Iowa Department of Human Services. Okay, so this is 235B, the law that I first discussed. And DHS should investigate this because John is arguably dependent based on the facts, and Alan is arguably a caretaker. You know, he's volunteered to get the medicine. So DHS should be looking at this. Um, he could also report it to the police, um, but as we all probably know, it's, it's probably not very likely the police are going to take this very seriously. I mean, it really depends on um, maybe other facts, but it is a small amount. Um, perhaps he, he will or will not be taken seriously by the police. He should certainly make a report, though. Um, he could contact the Iowa Legal Aid Hotline for Older Iowans. I work on that hotline. I do older abuse work. That case would come to me. Um, I could try to figure out if we could prove that, if, if we could file an elder abuse petition under 235F. Um, another resource that I, I want other attorneys to know about because it's so good is the Iowa Area Agencies on Aging. They have elder rights specialists that help with some of that more social work stuff that we lawyers really probably shouldn't be doing. Um, and I just think it's a wonderful resource. So if you're getting calls from low in your private attorney, you're getting calls from low income folks about elder abuse and you just want to make a quick referral, you know, you might want to send it to IRA area agency on aging, um, or to legal aid. Um, and then obviously, uh, the John could file the elder abuse petition under 235 F pro se. So here's another scenario. Um, John is 75. John's grandson, Charles, who is not John's caretaker, approaches John at home one day. Charles tells John that John has to sign a certain legal document. Charles says that if John signs the document, he'll get money from a lottery he had just won. The document is actually a financial power of attorney that would allow Charles to act for John in financial matters. John didn't win the lottery. He never entered the lottery. John signs the document. Charles takes the document to John's bank, withdraws $1,700 with it so he can buy a television for himself. Is that financial exploitation? Well, it's pretty obvious that it is on its face, but let's apply this again. So, Charles, um, can we say that he's an exploiter under 235F? Well, he stands in a position of trust or confidence because he's Charles' grandson. Um, so he's family. So again, remember that gap that I keep talking about, 235B, uh, where DHS might not be able to do something? Well, he's not a caretaker here, so you know he might not have any remedy with DHS there. Um, under 235F, he does have a remedy because because uh, Charles is family. Now, is Charles a vulnerable elder? Um, yes. I think he's very likely a vulnerable elder. If he has dementia too, it would be a clearer case because he would also have that mental uh, condition that made him vulnerable. Um, I say likely because I still think that case, that Chapman case, is, is rather odd. And I don't know that it's necessarily clear that age alone is sufficient. It probably is. Um, but I, I just think that, that that case is kind of odd. Um, and I would certainly make that argument if John were my client that I didn't need to prove anything um, as far as a physical or mental condition, but um, I'm honestly a little confused by that case and the language in it. Um, so that's why I say likely. Uh, and number three, what was the method? Well, Charles deceived John. He lied about what the document was. It wasn't a lottery document. It was a, it was a power of attorney document. So um, clearly he was very deceptive there. And then lastly, 
uh, where it was resources diverted. What happened? Well, Charles diverted resources. He took money from John's bank account. So, um, so I say this is very likely elder abuse, again, only because of that case. Um, I'm probably just being very careful there by saying likely. I mean, I think it, it's very strong possibility that this, this is clearly financial exploitation. The vulnerability being the only sticking point. So again, what can we do? Let's go through this again. Well, what if uh, John reported the, this to the Iowa Department of Human Services? What would happen? Well, it's not perfect because, as I've said, Charles isn't, uh, he isn't a caretaker. He's just a family member. So even assuming that DHS has all of the evidence they need to do whatever they're going to do to remedy this situation, they might say, I'm sorry, but under statute, we have to look at caretakers. So John in this situation is probably going to be out of luck, unfortunately. And then we could report this to the police. I didn't say in the fact pattern that John has some sort of mental condition that might make him more vulnerable to uh, exploitation such as dementia, Alzheimer's, or something like that. Um, but, I mean, the fact pattern suggests it. It seems like kind of a silly thing to fall for. Um, of course, any of us can fall for these sorts of tricks, but, um, you know, if the guy, if John has dementia, you know, I think that the likelihood that the police are going to say this is a civil matter um, because of this legal document that we have here is going to increase. And I think a lot of the abuse that, that we see with exploitation in, in particular, um, when it's coming from family members, is, is quasi-legal elder abuse. And what I mean by that is that there is a legal document. It might be fraudulent, but it's a good cover because police officers who might be more used to investigating more common crimes, such as, you know, say someone broke into your home and stole a safe, that's more obviously a criminal case. You know, a, a financial exploitation case like this might not be as um, straightforward to certain police officers about whether it's a crime or not. So um, I just make that point that um, a lot of this exploitation perpetuates because it's quasi-legal, because we have these documents that um, people can use as cover, exploiters can use as cover. So I think a report should be made, but obviously it's up in the air as to whether police would charge this criminally. You can also contact legal aid. I keep hammering this just to let everyone know that I exist and that I do this work. I'm here to help low-income folks with these sorts of problems, and um, I, we, we could give advice. Uh, we could possibly file an elder abuse petition, try to get a no-contact order, uh, try to get the, the money back that was taken. Again, to plug the Iowa area agencies on aging, they could do some of that social work stuff that maybe we shouldn't be doing as attorneys. You know, maybe the issue here is that the caretaker is, uh, or that uh, John needs a caretaker, um, and he's not getting a caretaker. Uh, AAA might be better positioned to find him one that's going to be suitable for him and his needs. And then again, filing the elder abuse petition under 235F. So let me talk a little bit more about the practicality, you know, what happens with this elder abuse petition. So the great thing about this petition is it can be filed by the alleged victim or it can be filed by a third party with knowledge uh, of the alleged elder abuse, and that's so the substitute petitioner. And under statute, it's not necessarily that the third party has to have knowledge. It's really just any interested person. So it, it could actually be, it, it could be anyone. Um, I just say with knowledge because, you know, I think it's better to have folks who know what's going on and can actually independently say what's going on, because if we have a victim whose family member is exploiting them, the victim is probably going to walk into court and say nothing is happening, right? So we probably need someone who knows independently what's going on, uh, but it's not technically a requirement under the law. Um, so the petitioner doesn't have to have an attorney. Obviously, they can be pro se. It's always advised that they have an attorney. Um, the substitute petitioner, um, if, if we have that in a, in a case with the 235F petition, uh, the alleged victim still has rights to come in, could still come in, contradict everything that the substitute petitioner is saying, uh, could come in and agree. You just you don't ever know really uh, what's going to happen, um, but uh, they do have rights to come in and um, give their side of the story. Um, 
this petition, uh, the 235 F petition is available online. So if you go to Iowa courts and you look under the court and court rules and forms tab, you will see the Iowa petition uh, for relief from elder abuse there, uh, ready to be filled in. Um, and I think that's really helpful because, you know, a lot of these issues are complex for pro se folks. And it's a good thing that this is available to, to folks to use if they can't get an attorney. Just like in the Chapman case, because uh, she didn't have an attorney. She just went down to her clerk, uh, clerk and filed it. Um, there is no filing or service fee. So again, this is very similar to that domestic abuse petition that we can use here in Iowa where you're not going to have to file, uh, pay to file it or serve it, uh, which is really good. You know, I have a lot of clients that don't have a lot of money because I work at Legal Aid. And, uh, you know, sometimes they struggle just to send me documents. They might not have enough money to send me the proof that, that I need that they're being exploited because, you know, it's the choices between eating or sending that to me. Um, so I really appreciate that that's um, how this law works. Um, the hearing has to be set uh, quickly. It's supposed to be five to 15 days after the date the petition is filed and the respondent is served. So what are the uh, remedies that you can get from this petition? Well, you could check the box on the petition requesting a temporary no contact order. Um, and you don't even have to have a hearing for that. You can just, um, if the facts on the face of the petition are sufficient, the court can enter a temporary emergency protective order um, in advance of the hearing. So most commonly that might be the alleged abuser has to vacate if, if they're sharing a home or cease contact with the alleged abused older island. And so that's, that's extremely helpful because a lot of these cases are family, friends, getting themselves into the home of an older island and not leaving, eating their food, uh, using their electricity, not paying rent, being mean, but not mean enough to, so that the police could come out. So this is really good uh, protection. We also obviously don't want retaliation. You know, if, we, if these folks in that situation that I just discussed, um, you know, if they filed this petition, uh, the chances are a lot higher that this, the family member or a friend that's exploiting them uh, might get physical if they weren't before, uh, before the hearing. So this is a good way to protect against retaliation. And what can you do if you prove elder abuse uh, at the hearing under 235F? Well, there's several things that the court can do. The first thing that they can do is enter a protective no contact order. Oh, I should mention um, elder abuse, this is in your packet, but elder abuse under 235F has to be proven by preponderance of the evidence. So pretty low standard. Um, so if you prove elder abuse by a preponderance of the evidence, the court can enter a protective no contact order. So cease contact. Um, that's going to be in place for a year. And you can actually request that that be extended another year uh, for good cause, but you have to do that before the order runs out. So um, if you're thinking about doing that, make sure you timely do it. If you have clients that want to do that, make sure you're timely about that. Um, the defendant can be ordered to move from the residence if they're sharing it with the victim. Um, and the defendant could be restrained from exercising um, any power over the victim. So let's say the defendant has a power of attorney that they're using nefariously and uh, the court could say stop, stop using that. And the defendant could be ordered to return property that's been stolen and exploited from them, including money, um, which is very powerful because again, we're talking about a, a hearing that occurs five to 15 days after you file and serve it, and, which is a really quick turnaround uh, to have a, a you know, hearing on something like this. Now, um, I do want to say, however, that the elder abuse petition uh, statute is specific on this, that um, you can't ask for real estate back, um, which is odd. I, I don't know that I understand why necessarily that is the way it is, but, um, you know, a lot of these exploitation cases involve transfer of homes which can impact Medicaid eligibility, which can impact 
exploited older Iowans' ability to get health care and perhaps nursing home stays that they might need. Uh, so it is a huge problem with these large real estate transfers that might happen. Um, but for whatever reason, we can't ask that the court, let's say, rescind some sort of real estate transaction uh, using 235F. So we're not going to be able to use that to address that particular problem, unfortunately. So let's go over um, another point here. Um, same scenario previously. Charles deceives John into signing a power of attorney document, except Charles is John's son, okay, so he's not his grandson, and he's, a legal uh, he's not a legal adult because he is 16 years old, and he's still not a caretaker. So can we call that financial exploitation under 235F? So remember, that's the scenario where Charles gives him a document. He says it's a lottery document. It's really not. He deceives him into signing it, and he goes off and withdraws $1,700 with it and buys himself a television. Can we call that financial exploitation? Well, I mean, obviously, it's not good. It's not moral. Um, it's uh, common sense elder abuse in a way. But, you know, this statute, it, it's so weird to me because the way it's written, remember how family is defined, that includes adult children or other relatives by blood or marriage. So in this case, just because Charles is a non-legal adult direct descendant, I wouldn't be able to file this petition against him because the statute says that he has to be an adult child. So I, that's another thing. I don't really understand why that's in the statute. I've asked around. Um, if anyone happens to know why that's the case, I'd love to know it. So please let me know. But I don't really know why that is. Um, so I just point that out. You know, elder abuse, a lot of times, we, do, we don't have a good remedy for it. It's one of those weird things that can happen to folks where there can be a lot of ambiguity, um, and sometimes we're struggling to fit the facts of the case and the remedy we're trying to get into existing law, and sometimes it's just not there. So you know, I make the point that I think a lot of times with elder abuse, what we need to be working on in addition to remedying it and um, getting a better understanding about how to remedy it is prevention. You know, I think we need to be working on, on prevention a lot too making sure folks are understanding the broad powers that they're giving away uh, when they give someone a financial power of attorney, for example. Um, I think that is a huge problem. I see a lot of uh, financial powers of attorney that say that you know, they can uh, say who can visit, who can't visit just because they're, <laughs> they're, they're parents in the nursing home just because they're powers of attorney. Um, there's rampant misunderstanding of what a financial power of attorney actually entails um, both on the part of the exploiter and abuser and the victim. So I think we really need to be doing our jobs and making sure that we're talking through with our clients um, who come in for a quick power of attorney uh, document that we might be doing for them that they are understanding fully and that they trust who it is that they're giving this power to. Because as I say, that quasi-legal exploitation is pretty rampant, I think, um, and unfortunate. So um, some issues and observations. Let me see. I'm doing very well on time. I have like 10 minutes, and this is the last slide. So I really hope a lot of folks come up with some questions, because I don't want to have to uh, uh, sit here for 10 minutes and uh, continue going. Um, so uh, come up with some questions and send them to me. But just some issues and observations I want to make on uh, 235F generally. Um, so I didn't mention this, but if a person um, we're filing this petition against is 17 years of age or younger, the district court waives jurisdiction and it goes to juvenile court, which is kind of strange. Um, because what if you're filing against someone who's a juvenile and who's a legal adult? Like, or let's say they were working together. How would that work? You know, are, are we going to have the same proceeding in juvenile court? Are we going to have to file two petitions and subpoena both of them? 
Um, it's just kind of one of those odd issues. I'm not really sure how that works. Um, if anyone has an idea about how it would work, I'd love to know it. Um, I did have a case where this was going to be one of the issues that I had to figure out, and it ended up having, I didn't have to go that far with it because it, it actually worked out before we got to court. Um, but I'm a little confused about how that would work. Um, and being such a new law, I don't know that it's necessarily clear. Um, so that is one issue that uh, might need to be sorted, or perhaps I'm just not understanding the proper way to go about it. So again, if anyone knows, let me know. The second thing that I've noticed is that the law does allow the court on its own motion or the motion of any other party to appoint a guardian ad litem for the vulnerable elder, if justice requires. And the question is, well, who pays for that? You know, I, I did a CLE a few months ago, and I had someone ask that question, and it was a wonderful question because, you know, money is pretty important in these issues about who's going to pay for what. Um, and the statute simply doesn't address that. It doesn't really say uh, who pays for this guardian ad litem. Um, and it seems kind of similar to that issue where you're suing someone who might be in prison on a, on a civil claim and you need to get a guardian ad litem, but there's no one who can pay for it, let's say. Um, so it seems like there might be a missing mechanism there to properly um, instigate this uh, portion of the statute here. Um, so if anyone knows, please let me know. Again, I'm learning with everyone else because this is a brand new statute, a pretty new statute, and not 100% clear. Um, another thing that I've noticed, and again, um, please send your questions because I'm coming to the end here. Um, an order or approved consent agreement under this section, again, I, I kind of already mentioned this, shall not affect title to real property. So that's very odd, again, because, you know, theoretically, you could ask for any amount of money back. Let's say someone had dementia and they gave away a $50 million estate. I mean, theoretically, you could, within 5 to 15 days, if you have the proof of that, you could have a hearing and you could, if you could prove it, you could probably get that back. But, but a real, a piece of real property, no matter the value, um, I can't get back with 235F. Again, something I don't understand. Do not understand that. Um, maybe another issue or observation is this kind of odd provision in the statute that allows the court to issue a subpoena, um, which is also kind of weird. Uh, the normal rules of civil procedure are followed under 235F proceedings. So, um, it's kind of a slight deviation there, um, and I tried that once, and I think the clerk was kind of confused <laughs> about that because it's kind of a weird way of going about doing that. Um, so, but th there is the power to ask the court to subpoena for certain records and, fo and people to come to your hearing. So that's helpful to know as well. Okay, well, how am I doing on time? Uh, we do have questions. Thank you all for send, sending these questions. Um, square. Hold on one second. I'm pulling these questions up. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. What remedies are available for a person who is wrongly accused under 235F? Recovery of fees, civil damages? That's a really good question. I haven't heard that question yet. Um, the, as far as I know, the judge does have the ability to assess attorney fees. I'm trying to remember now if the statute says against the respondent or just generally. Um, I don't know that that necessarily matters, but um, I assume the court could use attorney fees, so um, and I think the question is getting to a good point. You know, the, because of that that Supreme Court case where it makes it easier to file um, 
because of that vulnerability question and the fact that if you're over 60, age alone could be enough. Um, you know, I'm biased because I help victims. That's what I do. And I think, you know, it's great to make it easier. But we also have to recognize that whenever we make things easier to file, there's going to be abuse, right? So that's a great question. Um, I don't know that there's a specific remedy besides perhaps the ability to, to assess attorney fees against people who are doing that or just the basic fees about frivolous lawsuits, you know. Um, you could ask for sanctions if someone continues to, con to file this uh, elder abuse petition over the same facts or something, even though it's clearly on its face, um, you know, insufficient or um, just lies or abuse of process. Um, but I'm not aware of anything specific under the statute um, besides assessment of fees. Okay, let's see, I have some other ones. Another great question here, uh, what if the hearing does not occur within 15 days? I've never had that happen, so I don't know. Um, I mean, the statute says it's supposed to be five to 15 days. Does that mean that the court loses jurisdiction? What, I mean, what does that mean if they don't set it? Um, I wish I could answer that, but I honestly don't know what happens. I've never had that happen. Um, it might just be like a lot of other things where everyone just kind of ignores it. You know, the court just sets it and that's the time the court has for it. Um, but I, I don't know specifically if that has any legal ramification, um, assuming the hearing does not happen five to 15 days. That's a really good question. And it looks like we got about three minutes left. So I hope there's at least one more question. I'm not seeing any others. So if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to throw those out. I wanted to make good time to make sure that I had um, enough to, to answer for everyone. Um, and those packets that I sent out has, have quite a lot of information on them. I hope will be helpful to everyone. So maybe I'll wait a few seconds to see if anyone has any final one for me. Okay, Chrissy's going to give them the uh, activity ID number here. Go so ahead. while we're waiting for anybody to type any additional questions, I'll go ahead and give you the activity ID number for today. It is 267994. That number again is 267994. Also to remind everybody at the end, we'll give you a survey. Just take a couple minutes to fill that out. That would be great. It looks like you might want to repeat that because it says she can't hear. <laughs> Sorry about that. The activity ID number is 267994. That number again is 267994. All right, well, um, we have like two minutes left. I just wanted to again plug the two-page uh, volunteer lawyers project forms that I have on the end of the packets that you all have uh, for the CLE. Um, you know, we, I am serving some of the most vulnerable people I think in, in Iowa, um, and we need help. We need help. We need people to uh, to sign up for that. And I've had a pretty good response in the past uh, for other CLEs that I've done from private attorneys. You can sign up to take those pro bono. You could even sign up to take them on a fee basis. So if we have cases where there's money involved, so we're not gonna do it. Um, you know, if you wanna get on our list for that, please feel free to get those forms to me in any way that you'd like. If you wanna fax or email or whatever you'd wanna do, um, I'd really appreciate it. And how are we doing on time? Yes, and one other uh, final thing just to let everyone know, um, if anyone does have a final question, feel free to type it in, but um, I'm also going to be sending out, um, or Christy will be sending out at some point, forms that ask you to say what your knowledge of these issues was before my presentation and what it was after. Uh, the purpose behind that is, for my fellowship, I'm supposed to uh, train private attorneys in these issues, and I hope that this CLE has been helpful to you and all of the information I've given hopefully clears a lot of this stuff up. 
Um, and so the hope is that I've increased your knowledge um, in some capacity. So it does help me um, as a fellow if you fill that out. I'd really appreciate it um, to send those back to me. So you'll, you'll be getting those. Um, feel free to fill them out and send it back to me so I can continue doing this work. Um, it looks like I have another question. Do you help clients file, fill out the pro se form or do you draft your own petition and bring elder abuse? It's a great question. So as I said, that form is, is um, on the Iowa courts website. So you really just have to fill in the information that the statute requires, um, such as you know, the birthday of the uh, victim, so you can prove they're over 60, uh, the type of abuse that's going on, the relationship, all those things, you just fill that in. However, I think it's good practice, especially because this law is so new, um, to attach an addendum to that especially if you have a, a complicated case where you're not sure perhaps the judge, if you're in a more rural part of Iowa, you might not, the judge you might be going in front of might not have ever seen this before. Um, a lot of judges still don't know that this is, uh, uh, is, a, is a thing. <laughs> you know, I've had this where a judge asked, you know, why isn't DHS here? You know, this, um, so I think it's good practice sometimes, especially in the complicated cases, <clears throat> excuse me, to attach an addendum to better explain what it is you're seeking from the judge and to better explain, especially in financial exploitation, uh, the relationships between the alleged abuser, alleged uh, uh, victim, uh, so that you can get the relief you want under statute. 